Works of Love by Soren Kierkegaard, eighteen forty seven, translated from the Danish by David F. Swenson and Lillian Marvin Swenson in nineteen forty six, Princeton University Press, Volume Two, Chapter Seven, pages two fifty five to two fifty seven. Mercy, a work of love, even if it can give nothing and can do nothing. But to do good and communicate forget not but neither forget that this incessant worldly talk about charity and benevolence and generosity and liberality and gifts and donations is almost unmerciful oh let news writers and tax gatherers and parish beetles talk about generosity and count and count the receipts but let us never fail to realize that christianity essentially speaks about mercy that christianity would be the last of all to reward the unmerciful as if the poor and the wretched were not only in want of money and so on but were also excluded from the highest power of all that of being able to show mercy because they are not able to be generous charitable and benevolent but one preaches and preaches ecclesiastically and secularly about liberality and generosity one forgets even while delivering the sermon about mercy this from the christian standpoint is an indecency the poor man who sits in church must groan and why must he groan is it so that his groaning together with the preacher's eloquence might help to get the purse strings of the rich opened up oh no he must groan in the scriptural sense he must groan against the preacher because just when he is so eager to help him one suffers the greatest injustice woe to the one who consumes the inheritance of the widow and the fatherless but woe too to the preacher who keeps silent about mercy in order to speak about charity the preaching should be solely and alone about mercy if you know how to speak effectively about that then will the benevolence follow as a matter of course in proportion to the individual ability but consider this that if a man by talking about charity procured money 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 consider this that by keeping silent about mercy he acted unmercifully toward the very poor and wretched for whom he secured relief through the help afforded by the rich gifts of charity consider this that if the poor and the wretched disturb us by their petitions we may be able to get their poverty relieved by charity but then consider that it would be far more terrible if we forced the poor and the wretched to hinder our prayers by groaning against us to god as the scriptures say because we atrociously treated the poor and the wretched unfairly by not telling them that they can practice mercy we shall in this talk about mercy keep close to this thought and to guard ourselves against confusing mercy with what really belongs to external conditions over which consequently as such love has no control while it does truly have mercy in its power just as certainly as love has a heart in its bosom because a man has a heart in his bosom it by no means follows that he has money in his pocket but the former is far more important and is certainly decisive as regards mercy and truly if one had no money but really knew how to encourage and inspire the poor and the wretched by talking about mercy then he would have done quite as much as the one who throws some money to the poor or holds forth about charity from the rich so we shall meditate on mercy a work of love even if it can give nothing and can do nothing we shall strive according to the ability granted us to make it as obvious as possible as alluring as possible to bring as close home to the poor as possible what consolation there is for him in being able to be merciful we shall speak about this by doing away with a part of the worldly illusion but truly our desire is by means of what we say to contribute whatever is needed to make the one who can be charitable and benevolent as humble as possible in his giving as it is well pleasing unto god as modest in divine shyness as is becoming to a christian 
as willing to give and yet as unwilling to confess that it is alms as is the one who turns away his face in order not to be ashamed by others seeing that it brings him honor or as the one whose left hand actually does not know what the right hand does mercy has nothing to give it follows as a matter of course that if the merciful has anything to give then he gives it most willingly but it is not on this that we focus our attention but on the fact that one can be merciful without having the least thing to give and this is of great importance since the fact of being able to be merciful is a far greater perfection than having money and hence being able to give if that man celebrated for eighteen hundred years the good samaritan had not been riding but walking on the way from jericho to jerusalem where he saw the unfortunate man lying if he had carried nothing with him with which to bind up his sores if he had then lifted the unfortunate man up laid him upon his own shoulders and borne him to the nearest inn where the landlord would under no conditions receive either him or the unfortunate because the Samaritan did not have even a farthing and could only beg and beseech the hard-hearted landlord to be merciful, since a man's life was at stake. If he had not, therefore, still no, the story is not even finished. Hence, if the Samaritan now, far from losing patience because of this, had again gone on, carrying the unfortunate man, had looked for a softer bed for the wounded, had sat by his side, had done everything he could to staunch the flow of blood, but the unfortunate man had died on his hands. Would he not then have been just as merciful, quite as merciful, as that merciful Samaritan? Or would there be any objection to calling this the story of the good Samaritan? Take the story about the woman who laid the two pennies in the temple chest, but let us make a little poetic change in the story. The two pennies were to her a great sum, which she had not accumulated all at once. She had saved for a long time in order to get them together, and for that she had treasured them, wrapped up in a little cloth, in which to carry them when she went up to the temple. However, a thief had noticed that she had these pennies, had stolen them from her, and had left a similar cloth in place of hers, which contained nothing something the widow did not know hence she went up to the temple carrying as she supposed the two pennies that is nothing to the temple box i wonder if christ would still not have said what he did say of her that she gave more than all the rich still mercy without money what significance has it furthermore the worldly arrogance of charity and benevolence finally goes so far as to laugh at a mercy which has nothing for it is already bad and revolting enough this mercilessness of the earthly existence that when the poor gives his last shilling and then the rich comes and gives a hundred dollars that then all see the hundred dollars that is that the rich by his gifts entirely obscures the gift of the poor his mercy but what madness if what christ says is still true that the poor gave the most what madness that the one who gives less the rich and the great sum obscures the one who gives more the poor and the small portion moreover even obscures the one who gives most however of course the world does not say that it says that the rich gave most and why does the world say this because the world understands only about money and christ only about mercy